Good evening and welcome. I'm Ben Tudelo, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geoscience and the Faculty of Science and the lead for the Gallagher Colloquium series. It is wonderful to have so many of you joining us online for tonight's Gallagher Colloquium presentation, giving us the opportunity to engage with more attendees from around the globe. We are recording today's session, and we will be posting this video on the Faculty of Science website. I encourage you to check out our website, science.ucalgary.ca, for event listings and video updates. As we come together, in these times of physical distancing and vi virtual connections, I like to think about who I'm sharing the space with now, both near and far. We are based in Calgary, which is located on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Pakani, the Guyana First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. The University of Calgary is situated on, situation, situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River. The traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call the city of Calgary. Since 2015, the Department of Geoscience has organized over 30 Gallagher Colloquium series lectures and invited speakers to share their passion for science, scientific research, and exploration. I'd like to take a moment and recognize the Gallagher family for making this series possible through their generosity and vision for deep connections between the university and the surrounding community. Their generosity allows us to promote and build public support for science and scientific research and helps us understand why science is fundamental and important not only to our own lives, but to the world around us. Tonight, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Sasha Wilson. Dr. Wilson is Associate Professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from the University of Alberta and the Canada Research Chair in Biogeochemistry of Sustainable Mineral Resources at the University of Alberta. She leads the Environmental Economic Geology Lab in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. Dr. Wilson is a mineralogist and a biogeochemist who works, whose work focuses on environmental aspects of economic geology and on chemical sedimentology. She uses mineral behavior with a particular focus on crystal chemistry to understand and manage environmental change in engineered and natural settings. In her research, she employs field observations, analytical geochemistry, and field laboratory and synchrotron light experiments to quantify environmental processes. Sasha obtained her BSc in physics from McMaster University in 2003 and her MSc and PhD in environmental geochemistry from the University of British Columbia in 2006 and 2010, respectively. She held a NASA postdoctoral fellowship at Indiana University Node of the Astrobiology Institute from 2010 to 2011 and was a faculty member at Monash University before relocating to the U of A. In recognition of her outstanding contributions to the field, Sasha received the 2016 E.S. Hills Medal from the Geological Society of Australia, the 2017 Mineralogical Association of Canada Young Scientist Award, and an ICEF Top 10 Innovation Award. Sasha and I happened to work on some of the or at some of the same field sites in the Caribou Plateau of British Columbia, and I have always very much enjoyed talking with Sasha and her students and postdocs about our findings at those fascinating sites, as well as their broader research program. Therefore, I'm very excited that you will all be exposed to Sasha's fascinating research today. Please join me in welcoming Sasha, who will give a talk entitled Enhanced Weathering as an Ore Processing Technique for CO2 Mineralization and Critical Metal Recovery. Take it away, Sasha. Thanks very much for that very kind introduction, Ben. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight uh, for my talk. Before I get into it, I'd like to acknowledge that much of the work that I'll be presenting tonight is work that was led by former PhD students and postdoctoral fellows who've since moved on to bigger and brighter opportunities. In particular, Jess Hamilton, who's now a staff scientist at uh, the Australian Synchrotron, Janine McCutcheon, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo, and Connor Turvey, who is now a postdoc at the University of British Columbia. The mineral waste from many mines, including many of the mines that we have here in Canada, has the ability to naturally remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, trapping and storing it within stable carbonate minerals. 
Interestingly, by some estimates, we may need to double the amount of mining that we do today in the coming decades in order to supply the critical raw materials we need to build renewable energy infrastructure and start to decarbonize our economy to reach our net negative and climate change emissions goals. Today, I'd like to talk about an opportunity that there is to create a synergy between carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere and providing the critical metals that we need to build the green economy. One question that's on everyone's mind, in particular 26 just having ended, is what do we need to do to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees? And the, the details are a tremendous undertaking, but in a nutshell, it can be encompassed in this graph from a recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. What I have here on the y-axis is degrees in Celsius above a baseline temperature for the average temperature of the Earth, from zero to two degrees, where zero is the temperature that the Earth was on average in around 1850 to 1900, before the Industrial Revolution really kicked off and accelerated change. On the x-axis, I've got dates from 1960 to 2100. So we are here at the end of 2021. This curve shows estimated anthropogenic warming. So the warming that we've caused to date, which has been well measured and documented. And these are possibilities for the future, futures where we take, our, take responsibility for our emissions and do everything we can to reach net zero by 2050 and to decarbonize society and shift to different energy systems. So our goal is to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius if it's possible. So that's the limit that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has set for mitigating and avoiding the worst consequences of global warming. So many of us are aware of this 2050 goal where we have to be net zero. So by that date, within 29 years, globally, for every car ton of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, we have to take one ton down. So that's what net zero means. On a net level, we emit nothing to the atmosphere. The scarier part of this graph that doesn't always reach the news is this, this goal by 2100. So it turns out that we actually have to remove between 100 and 1,000 billion tons of carbon dioxide from air by 2100 in order to keep this 1.5 degree warming goal within sight. And so that's in addition to making our society completely net zero. And this is a possibility that many scientists and engineers have been anticipating for the last few decades. And so Many of us have been developing what are called negative emissions technologies. So these are technologies, the toolbox that we've built for pulling carbon dioxide out of air and locking it into geologic formations back into the earth where it's stable. And so these techniques are, are many and varied and here are the main ones. We can store carbon in coastal environments and plants and sediments and water and other natural scenarios like enhancing storage of carbon in soil organic matter. So these negative emissions technologies range from being highly engineered and sophisticated technologically and being very familiar. So on the highly technological end, we have direct air capture or DAC, which uses fans and absorbents to pull or mine carbon dioxide out of the air. It's then compressed and injected underground where it's stored in geological formations. On the more familiar end, we have planting trees, building new forests and regrowing forests in order to store carbon in biomass. Somewhere in the middle, we have what I'm going to be talking about today, which uh, is accelerated chemical weathering of rocks. And that just means accelerated dissolution of rocks. And this sounds a, a little strange. How does that actually work? Well, it turns out that the dissolution of rocks naturally removes about a billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year. 
And this is the Earth's natural uh, climate regulation system. It's the Earth's thermostat. In this image on the left, uh, we've got a, a satellite view off the coast of Newfoundland. And so how, and how weathering works to mitigate climate is carbon dioxide in the air becomes dissolved in rainwater and it makes fizzy water, a lot like this carbonated beverage that I'm drinking right now. And I get in a little bit of trouble from my dentist for drinking too much fizzy water because it etches away at my teeth. And if fizzy water can dissolve our teeth, it can also dissolve rocks, albeit very slowly. So that carbonated water containing carbonic acid leaches magnesium and calcium from silicate rocks. And that's carried by rivers into the ocean where something really cool happens. All that magnesium, calcium, and dissolved carbon dioxide and slightly fizzy water ends up going through a reaction that's catalyzed by microorganisms. So these blue green swirls, these massive swirls off the coast of Newfoundland are algal blooms. And so these photosynthetic microbes catalyze the reaction of magnesium and calcium with that dissolved CO2 to make calcium and magnesium carbon atoms, like calcite and dolomite. And so over geological time, this natural process of rock dissolution, dissolving rocks and making new carbonate rocks creates massive formations of carbonate minerals, like the limestone and dull stone that we see in the Rocky Mountains. And it all moves through these microorganisms that catalyze reactions to make carbonate minerals. So a billion tons is a lot, but the problem is that we emitted 30.5 billion tons in 2020 alone. So the natural process can't keep up with our emissions, at least not on the time scale that we need it to. So Earth's old fashioned recipe for turning carbon dioxide into rocks looks a little like this. And uh, I'm a geochemist, so I have a weakness for chemical equations. So here's, here's the recipe as a chemical equation. So first we take magnesium or to a lesser extent, calcium silicate rich minerals like serpentine, this green mineral shown here, and we react it with carbon dioxide dissolved in water to make carbonic acid. And an interesting thing about a lot of these magnesium silicate minerals is that they're basic. So we've got a big hydro, a bunch of hydroxyl groups in the mineral. So it's a classic acid-base neutralization reaction. And the products are hydrated silica or opal and carbonate minerals. In this case, magnesium carbonates. And basically what we're making is that amorphous silica that you get in those little sachets when you buy electronics and it says, do not eat. And if there are any rock climbers in the audience, we're, we're making rock climbing chalk or antacid. So those are pretty benign products. So if we want to accelerate this process to help remove more CO2 from atmosphere, we're not too worried that we're making anything particularly nasty. So enhanced weathering of rocks and accelerated mineralization of carbon dioxide has been developed into a number of related technologies over the last few decades. And so based on a, a report that uh, Ben and I were both involved in from the Energy Futures Initiative in 2020, there's potential to accelerate this natural cycle, that 1 billion tons of CO2 sequestered a year by one to 10 times. So we're starting to think in the range of possibility of 10 billion tons of CO2 removed by just accelerating this natural process that the earth does already. And so there are surface, subsurface and hybrid approaches that have been developed to accelerating um, chemical weathering of rocks and production of carbonate minerals. And today I'll mostly be focusing on the ones that we can implement at earth's surface. So we have a, a huge abundance of finely pulverized and ex already extracted um, magnesium silicate and calcium silicate rocks that have produced, been produced by mining and other industrial processes. So we have massive stockpiles of this material that can be carbonated within um, waste storage facilities at, uh, in industrial landscapes by using existing infrastructure and industry know-how. 
we can also take that material if it is deemed safe to do so and spread it out to use as a fertilizer in agriculture and in agroforestry. And this is something that's traditionally been done in farming for a long time. So using lime to add calcium and to increase the pH of soils has been practiced for at least centuries. And using silicate minerals, um, calcium silicates is very common in Southern Ontario where I'm from in agriculture. And that's um, a waste product of quarries that generated it for part of the steel making process. So we've got opportunities to apply this at our surface to increase capture of CO2 from air into carbonate minerals. Other technologies use a, a different approach to capture CO2 from air, for instance, using direct air capture with fans and absorbents or biomass uh, burning and collection of that carbon. And then that's injected underground into the same magnesium and calcium silicate rocks like basalts and peridotites that we use at the surface to mineralize carbon. So the, the most reactive rocks on earth are mine tailings. And mine tailings are the finely pulverized wastes that are left over from the mining process. And so this is typically a fine sand uh, in modern mines, sometimes up to a gravel in old, some older mines, depending on the commodity. And globally, we produce about 8.9 billion tons per year of this fine ground rock material. About half a billion tons of that is highly reactive to carbon dioxide and can be used to remove CO2 from air. And so those mine tailings come from nickel, cobalt, platinum group element, diamond, historical crystal asbestos, and chromite mines. And much of Canada's mineral wealth is, comes from these commodities, which are hosted in magnesium-rich rocks, serpentinites, kimberlites, and peridotites. So I wanted to give you an example of the scale at which a single mine can remove carbon dioxide from air. And that comes from uh, the Mount Keith nickel mine, where I spent a, a month um, coring a lot of samples with uh, my collaborator and friend Ian Power at Trent University. And so every place that you see a number, we collected between one and 18 cores down to two meters depth. So we ended up with about a thousand samples that I took back to the lab and did isotope geochemistry, um, elemental chemistry, petrography, and a whole lot of mineralogy on. And what I found when I measured the amount of carbon that was being sequestered at this mine was something pretty cool. One, one interesting thing about some mine tailing storage facilities like the one at Mount Keith is that the tailings deposits in these yellow areas that are mapped out and in the center have different known ages of deposition. So these tailings were known to have been deposited and exposed to the air for periods between zero and 10 years. So that allowed me to create a rate for how much carbon was being deposited over time. And what I found was that the Mount Keith mine offsets about 11% of its annual greenhouse gas emissions by passive or unintentional capture of CO2 from air every year, which is pretty cool. It's about 40,000 tons of carbon every year. And one of the most interesting results is that only about 1% of this massive five kilometer wide waste storage facility is actually being carbonated. So there's potential to accelerate that rate by 10 times and you would have a carbon neutral mine by a hundred times and you would have a negative emissions technology. And this is something mining companies are starting to look at. Can they deliver carbon dioxide removal services by mining CO2 as well as metal resources. And so 1% isn't great. Um, we're in a bit of a bind and we need to accelerate this process. And since mine tailings are the most reactive rocks and have the most suitable chemistry, we need to do it there. So we can ask uh, what limits the rate of carbon mineralization? How can we make it faster? So it really makes a dent in, in our emissions reductions requirements. So there are three processes that could be limiting um, mineralization of carbon. The first is mineral dissolution. 
we might not be getting magnesium or calcium out of the silicate minerals fast enough. And some of them are pretty slow to dissolve. It could be CO2 supply. Although having about 420 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is causing us all manner of havoc, it's still quite a dilute source of CO2 um, to use for an industrial scale reaction. So there are ways of concentrating CO2 using um, biology or using um, other means, for instance, direct air capture. Carbonate precipitation, we used to think that it could be limiting uh, mineralization of carbon, but now we know that that's really quite fast. So it's mineral dissolution and the rate of CO2 supply that really slow down the process. And so those are the big, the big hurdles that we need to overcome in order to accelerate things. So coming back to Earth's old fashioned recipe for removing carbon dioxide from air and turning it into minerals, we can think about how to tweak this in order to make it go faster. We can add more carbon dioxide at a faster rate. We can use more awesome acids. So carbonic acid and carbonated water is a weak acid, but um, microbes, for instance, naturally produce sulfuric acid, which is a much stronger acid in mine tailing storage facilities. And this can be controlled in a way that doesn't cause problems and can be used to process ore. We can also use catalysts, for instance, um, enzymes or microorganisms to accelerate reactions. And these are technologies that have already been introduced in metal mining, so it's not too far out there. And so for the, the rest of the, the talk, I wanted to focus on one field site that I studied with my friend and colleague Gordon Southern and his group at the University of Queensland. And so this is the Woods Reef Chrysotile Mine. So it's located in northern New South Wales, and this is a very small tailings pile. Woods Reef was mined for chrysotile asbestos or white asbestos in the 1970s and into the early 1980s when a lot of jurisdictions stopped mining asbestos for obvious reasons. And 24.2 megatons of tailings were produced over the operational lifetime of Woods Reef. And this is about the scale of mining that a single large nickel mine can do in a year. So Woods Reef is small. It's a nice place to um, conduct experiments looking at acceleration trials. And so we knew that passive mineral carbonation, removal of CO2 from air was occurring there because Hans Oskierski at Murdoch University did a really nice study documenting it. And so we've been working together on the site since. And so here's an aerial view of uh, the Woods Reef pile. And uh, Connor Turvey, uh, during his PhD, took on the Herculean task of determining what the carbonation rate was for the site and how much CO2 was being sequestered per year. And so every place where you see a dot, um, Connor and my other colleagues who worked on this study and I had to dig a hole. So the tailings at Woods Reef are gravel and if anyone's ever tried to core gravel, it is a pretty thankless task. So we had to take shovels and dig trenches in order to get profiles um, down to depth to see how much carbon was being removed as a function of depth below the surface of the tailings. And so uh, with all of Connor's great efforts, um, his best estimate for how much CO2 is trapped at Woods Reef is just under 14,000 tons of CO2 is trapped in carbonate minerals. And these are mostly magnesium carbonate minerals. And so uh, Australia no longer has a carbon tax. It was repealed um, a few years back. But if we were to import a Canadian carbon tax at $40 a ton to Woods Reef, the carbon stored there would have a value of a little over half a million dollars. And if the carbon tax goes up to $170 a ton in 2030, as has been proposed, the value of that CO2 goes up to 2.5 million. And so one of Connor's interesting results was again, that we're only carbonating about 1% of the total potential in this mine tailing storage facility. So there's potential to increase carbonation. 
so carbon removal, and also the value of that carbon to, to finance these projects by 10 times or 100 times. And, uh, but because I work in, in resource geology, I've got my resource geologist hat on, and uh, I'm, while I'm putting a few dollar signs on things, I wanted to take a step back and start to think about critical metals in mine tailings. So um, before I, I relocated to the University of Alberta, I was based at Monash University, as Ben mentioned, and I was fortunate to have uh, the Australian synchrotron, so the National Synchrotron Light Source, right across the road. And so what we did was we took some thin sections of carbonated crusts, so that were very carbon rich and had weathered to bind carbon from the atmosphere to the Australian synchrotron. And we used a really cool technique called X-ray fluorescence microprobe or X-ray fluorescence microscopy. And here's an example of an entire thin section with a five millimeter scale bar um, displaying X-ray fluorescence microprobe data. And so this entire thin section has been mapped using 20 micrometer pixels that are completely quantitative for most of the first and second rows of the periodic table in the transition metals. And so we can see where oxides, garnets, sulfides, and serpentine are located. And so this isn't a thin section from Woods Reef, but it's from another abandoned nickel mine that was located in Tasmania. And I think this is a really interesting slide to look at because this is waste material from a nickel mine that operated 100 years ago. And what we're seeing here is a map in red of iron, in blue of nickel, and green in cobalt. And this was a random cobalt that got turned into a thin section. A lot of them look like this. So again, there's a nickel map where bright colors are up to 40% nickel. Iron also charts this, the sulfides. And we have quite a lot of cobalt, up to 30%. And so that's in pentlandite and cobalt pentlandite. And so 100 years ago, we were throwing away magically high-grade ores that are vanishingly rare today. And so it's interesting to think about these resources that we have scattered all across the world and what we can go back and recover. When we look at thin sections that were made from carbonated crusts at Woods Reef, it's a, a little less impressive because this was a, a modern mine and grades were lower. So what we have is we have these highly cemented crusts um, that are tailings grains of serpentine cemented by magnesium carbonate minerals, hydromagnesite, pyroaurite, and cholinite. And so when we make a thin section out of that and take it back to the synchrotron, we were curious to see where were critical metals going during the carbonation reaction. So here's a view from this thin section in a scanning electron microscope image, where we have a serpentine green pointed out in the middle as being a brighter gray and a magnesium carbonate mineral growing off of it as it dissolves and binds carbon from air. In figure B, we have an X-ray fluorescence map. So a quantitative map of elemental abundances for that same spot. In green, we see the silicon rich serpentine grain. And then we have this kind of purple nebulous fuzz around it. And that's the magnesium carbonate mineral, which is rich in iron and manganese. And so that was pretty interesting. When we have a look at that grain again, so this is a silicon map in figure C, where high concentrations of silicon are bright colors and low are dark colors. So when we look at that middle yellow box at the interface where the hydromagnesite is growing and binding carbon from air, we can blow that up into figure D. And over top of that, plot the abundances of different critical metals that we might want to recover. As the abundance of silicon goes down, as we move into the hydromagnesite, what we find is that the abundances of nickel, manganese, cobalt, chromium, and iron stay relatively constant. So these metals don't move very far. They're immobilized and are actually incorporated 
into the carbonate minerals. What we find is that they replace magnesium and iron in the structures of these magnesium carbonate minerals that I've listed in the upper left. And they also become associated with rust minerals, iron oxyhydroxides that also form during the carbonation reaction. And so why is that, why is that interesting? Well, when we started looking at these metals out of curiosity, I started to think about how much nickel is actually in this small tailings pile at Woods Reef. The amount of nickel is 0.2% by weight. So one five hundredth of the pile by mass is nickel. Not a lot, right? But if we figure out how many tons that is, it's about 14, 8,000 tons of nickel. And I looked up the price of nickel today and was pretty shocked because it went up again. So that's about a billion tons US of nickel. And it might not be um, economical to mine from a deposit this small, but we have billions of tons of this stuff at similar grade just lying around here in Canada, particularly in, in Quebec. And so 0.28% is pretty low compared to the super high nickel grades of the past, but it's a similar abundance. It's a similar grade compared to that of the massive Dakar BC and Dumont Quebec nickel projects, which are likely going to be turned into mines in the future. So that's the grade we're exploring at. So it's worth revisiting. And so the pr problem is the critical metals like nickel that I want to recover are trapped inside the same carbonate minerals that are storing carbon dioxide. And the only way to really get them out is to dissolve the carbonate minerals and release the CO2, which we really don't want to. So my coworkers are working on this project and I asked the question, how do we have our cake, remove CO2 from air and eat it too, recover the metals from this waste? And one solution we came up with was thinking about one-step versus two-step carbonation reactors. And um, folks like me who work in mine tailings environments and also environmental engineers tend to think of these landscapes as chemical reactors or bioreactors. And so the Woods Reef tailings pile is a one-step reactor. So both rock dissolution to release magnesium and carbonation to bind the carbon with the magnesium occur inside the tailings. Everything's in the same pot. And so most mine tailing storage facilities uh, are like this today. So we asked, what would a two-step or step reactor look like? One that did rock dissolution um, within the tailings, but separated the carbon process into something like a pond, for instance. And so nature's already invented one of these things. It's called the nickel laterite. So a nickel rich soil that's mined as a resource. And so this is exactly what we wanna do because this pile at Woods Reef is crushed up serpentinite and a nickel laterite also forms from serpentinite from these magnesium silicate rich rocks. So we have our fizzy water, our carbonic acid and rainwater over geologic time dissolving the magnesium out. And so serpentine is a basic mineral, right? So at some point we have a neutralization point. And what happens there is all the iron that doesn't like to be in solution at high pH crashes out as rust, oxyhydroxide minerals. And that scavenges all the metals like nickel and cobalt and scandium and what have you in, in laterite into this rust layer. And that's what we mine. We're really good at mining nickel and other elements from laterites. And then out the bottom, after that one step, we have the second step. We have a high pH magnesium rich leachate come fall out the bottom of the, the soil, and that's perfect for carbonation. So Jess Hamilton and I set about trying to do this in miniature in the laboratory, making tiny two-step reactors, filling them up with mine tailings, and seeing what happens when we accelerate that leaching process that separate the rock dissolution and carbonation steps. So we had uh, very small plastic syringes that were taped onto um, centrifuge tubes. It's pretty simple. And in there we had tailings from, from the Woods Reef mine. 
And so step one was to apply um, acid treatments once a day, collect the leachate, and then figure out how much magnesium was in them and how much carbon we could sequester. In the second step, um, in my lab more recently, we've tended to use um, carbonation reactors that employ microorganisms that have been grown from mines. And so if you remember back to that image off the coast of Newfoundland, I showed at the start of the talk, where we had those blue green swirls of photosynthetic microbes. We're using that same process that the earth uses to make carbonate minerals, but just in miniature, where we keep these photosynthetic microbes happy and they bind the magnesium and carbon for us. And so I want to show you some of the results um, comparing with what we measured naturally at the Woods Reef site. So our two-step rock dissolution results yielded some, some interesting information. So down in the, the bottom left corner, we've got a plot of concentration of magnesium in milligrams per liter. So we've got some pretty high concentrations up to around two and a half grams, three grams per liter. And over the course of 28 days. So each day, Jess added one small treatment of dilute sulfuric acid. So using a slightly more awesome acid than fizzy water. And she also did column experiments where she only added um, just regular water from the lab. With the regular water from the lab being added every day, simulating rainwater, about 0.35% of the magnesium in one of those little columns was released and provided so that it could be carbonated. But when she added the slightly more awesome acid every day at a dilute concentration, after 28 days, she got out of about 8.5% of the magnesium. And there was no sign that um, the concentrations were going to go down anytime soon. So extrapolating those results with reactor transport modeling for one year of experiments, just estimated that uh, with the acid treatment, the CO2 uptake rate could increase by about 100 times over what we observe naturally. So the potential is there to trap about 22 grams of carbon dioxide per meter squared surface area of the tailings pile at Woods Reef every year. That's a lot. And so we only really needed one order of magnitude increase to make up for historical carbon emissions at the mine. But this is getting into the realm where it, it could be useful for negative emissions. With water, we ended up getting 240 grams of CO2 over the same footprint per year. And so that was really good to see that it's within the range of historical uptake that Connor calculated from digging a whole lot of trenches. And it's interesting to, to think about this, this leaching process because it's something that we already do in, in metal mining, for instance, in gold mining and other metal commodities where we install something like a golf course sprinkler system on top of a big pile of crushed up rock and we collect the leachate and remove the metals that we want to use from that. So this technology, heap leaching, already exists and we think that we might be able to transport this carbonation process into that regime. So coming back to the critical metal story, we've had a success with magnesium release. One interesting thing that we saw, and it's um, kind of recorded in Sharpie pen here, is that with each successive acid, acid treatment and rock dissolution, we got thicker and darker orange-red rust layer forming. And that progressively moved further down the column with each treatment. So by day six, it was around the 40 millimeter point near the top of the syringe where the acid was delivered. By day 19, it was somewhere near the middle of the column. By day 28, it was closer to the bottom. And since we had a synchrotron right next door, we went back there to have a look at what was in those rust layers. And what we found was pretty neat. So taking one of these columns that had had successive acid treatments, uh, we took a, we made a huge thin section out of it. And then we did the same with another column that had only been treated with water every day. And what we got were some pretty neat maps of metal concentration. So in the upper left, uh, sorry, the upper right, 
what I have is a, a series of maps of different elements of the same thin section. So this is the same, same thin section, but viewed in iron concentration, chromium concentration, cobalt, nickel, and manganese. And at zero centimeters at the top, that's where the acid was delivered. At seven centimeters at the bottom, that's where a high pH magnesium rich solution came out to be carbonated. So we see the rust layer, the iron oxide, oxide hydroxides, as this bright colored spot in the leftmost top image. And we see chromium concentrated there, cobalt, nickel, and manganese. And in some cases, we reached concentrations of more than one weight percent. So we were able to upgrade by nearly an order of magnitude the concentration of the critical metals in these itty bitty artificial laterites. Um, the water leach columns, um, you can see on the, the bottom right that it's pretty boring, which is what we expected. So we end up seeing progressive upgrading of critical metals in, in these rust metals. And we already know how to process them because we know how to process laterites, these nickel rich soils. And so this was nice, right? It was a good outcome for an itty bitty artificial nickel laterite, um, a teacup sized one. But we wanted to see how, how much we could scale this up um, and demonstrate that we could do it on at least a meter scale. So we needed a bigger test tube. And because the Woods Reef mine was mined for crystal asbestos, that meant that we had to treat it as a hazardous site. So we all wore moon suits and duct taped ourselves into um, our boots and gloves and wore HEPA respirator masks. So it was pretty grueling work. And so just a shout out to Connor, Jess and Al and Janine, who's not in this photo from Gord. So what we did was we hauled two tons of water up the slope of the tailings pile. You can see it's uh, at a fairly decent elevation, a whole bunch of scientific monitoring equipment. And it took a couple of weeks to do this safely. So we did two field trials. And the first was one that was led by Jess. And this was for accelerated rock dissolution. So getting that magnesium out and seeing whether we could upgrade the critical metals using these dilute sulfuric acid treatments. And so what we did was we, we basically built like a, a garden sprinkler system um, from the Australian equivalent of Canadian Tire. And we hooked it up to a bunch of automation equipment and scientific monitoring equipment. So we had a solar powered um, acid sprinkling system. So we had one ton tank of uh, pH neutral creek water that we hauled up the tanning spile and a tank of acidified uh, water. So using sulfuric acid, again, because it's something that we know bacteria can naturally make in a mining environment. And it's more awesome than fizzy water. So the sprinkler system worked for about two or three weeks until we had an extreme weather event or kangaroos put into the water. We're still not sure which, but nonetheless, it ended. And from the results, we, we found that we had that accelerated dissolution of the rock, release of magnesium, and our formation of the rust layer that concentrates nickel and cobalt and other critical metals formed almost immediately. And over the course of those few weeks, it got thicker and more concentrated and started moving down the pile, just like in our lab experiments. So we, we know this works for concentrated critical metals, but the tricky thing was um, we only got the same carbonation rate as what we saw at, as the baseline. And it seems that our CO2 supply was still too low, even though we found a way to accelerate magnesium supply to make carbonate minerals. We just didn't have enough CO2. But so we needed a more concentrated source of carbon dioxide or some way to scavenge CO2 from air at a faster rate and catalyze the reaction. And so if you look at this kind of blue-green mush that's in this old mine pit, that was what we went for. So thinking back again to the slime I had in those jars and to the blue-green algae swirls and that satellite image, we wanted to get photosynthetic microbes to help us make carbonate minerals because they've been excellent at it for billions of years. So this was um, Janine's field trial. So we took the learnings from the first one where we knew acidification of the tailings helped release magnesium. 
So Janine marked out some plots, put a nice note. This is my PhD, please don't move anything. And everyone was nice about it. And then used the same concentration of dilute sulfuric acid to release magnesium. So the first step of the reaction. Then she took a bunch of uh, photosynthetic microbes from the mine pit, which is green because of those microbes, took them back to the lab, got them healthy, grew them up. So she had several liters of them and then raked them into that plot that you see in the upper right corner. So there's a, a zoom in of that in the bottom right corner of the microbes. And so within nine weeks, uh, Janine came back and what we found was that the microbes had trapped nearly two times the amount of carbon in that plot compared to what happened in 30 years as the baseline rate. So the catalytic power of the biosphere was what we needed in this instance to overcome that CO2 limitation. And so just to, just to close the talk, I wanted to leave you with this thought that we might be able to envision a different sort of mine tailing storage facility one that's useful for the, the 21st century, where we combine critical metal recovery and enhancing that because we need these resources, nickel and cobalt are essential for batteries and carbon dioxide removal from the air. So by applying waste acids or using microbes to create natural acids for us, we can create something like an artificial nickel laterite concentrating metals in what we have otherwise viewed as a waste. And we have billions of tons of this stuff just sitting around. And then what we can have is have our leachate pond where we have a high pH magnesium rich metal, which we turn into a carbonation pond full of friendly microorganisms. And so those microorganisms naturally grow in mine pits and water reclamation ponds. And they actually sometimes make microbialites, like stromatolites. It's pretty wild and they can do it quite fast. So just to close, we can think about the mine pit or water reclamation pond becoming something like a natural carbonate lake. And the tailings themselves becoming part of the ore processing circuit, part of the mine plan. And eventually using this artificial nickel laterate process to turn them some, into something more like a soil and less like a bunch of waste rock. Thanks very much for your time and attention and I'm glad to take questions. Thank you very much, Sasha, uh, for sharing your research with us this evening. That was excellent. I enjoyed it very much. You showed expertly and compellingly that geochemistry and mineralogy are vital tools in humanity's quest to combat the biggest challenges of the 21st century. I know that many of you in the audience have questions for our speaker. And so if you could please type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, we will answer them as the, in the order that they come in. And we appreciate all your questions, but due to time, we may not be able to answer all of them. We're gonna do our best to get through as many of them tonight as we can. And we're gonna potentially group similar questions together as necessary. So I'll just start out with a, a basic question or a, a really geochemistry oriented question, Sasha. So the, I, I found that, you know, the nickel laterite analogy quite compelling and quite interesting. Um, so I think in nature, it takes, you know, some time to make a nickel laterite. And I think to me, the, the thing that always has struck me about laterites is that it takes quite a lot of water too, right? And so I think in places like I don't, I don't know exactly, my, my geography of Australia is very poor, but it seems, I think the places where that you're showing us in Australia are, are fairly dry. And so I, I was just wondering about this water, the need for water and how that works in, in these schemes. That's a great question. And uh, water of course is our most precious resource at all, of all. So this technique wouldn't necessarily be feasible in some environments, in arid environments in particular. So in some parts of Australia where it's uh, rainier and more tropical, um, Woods Reef is kind of marginal for that. It, it could be applied, but of course we really want to be careful about water restrictions. So for instance, in, in Canada where we have uh, abundant water, perhaps it would work better here. But, but again, that, that absolutely has to go into life cycle assessments for feasibility. I'm glad you asked that. 
Yeah, it's uh, obviously we we work on similar things. We always have to deal with the same sort of limitations to the things we're trying to do. So a question coming up from Igor Pavlovsky, a, a graduate of our graduate program here. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. What is the ultimate fate of the sulfur from the acid that you use to enhance the leaching? That's a fantastic question. So the, the sulfur would generally produce sulfate minerals. And in some cases we find that it scavenges, scavenges some of the magnesium, so it competes with carbonate for it. So we're, we're working on acid recycling scenarios where we could remove the sulfate and regenerate it again so that we can save on acid. Okay, uh, next up we have a question from one of our um, Gallagher's from Tom Gallagher, who I think is probably very close to me right now as I'm on Vancouver Island, very close to him, I think. Uh, what is the growth rate of the bacterial colonies in these situations? And does that dictate the overall carbon sequestration potential? That's a great question. So with the, the, the growth rate cyanobacteria are the microbes that we're using, and they can be a little slow to start, but once you get a, a colony up and running, they're super robust and you can get enormous thick mats of them. So you just need to keep them happy. And one of the interesting things is that they're generally pretty happy to live on dissolved rock. They get most of their nutrients from it. Sometimes we, we just throw in a little bit of phosphorus to keep them, keep them green, but uh, they, they are slow and you do have to nurture them. So it's something like uh, with bio leaching and gold mining, for instance, where um, we take uh, bacteria that are good at dissolving um, iron sulfide minerals to get the gold out, but you have to keep them happy at the right temperature and give them nutrients. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have a, a question, I think a very practical one, uh, and I was wondering this myself, from Michael Briscoe. How do you make cross sections out of finely ground rock for use in the synchrotron? With very great difficulty. <laughs> uh, that's a fantastic question, great technical question, because we really struggled with this. And if you want a, a more detailed answer, um, please don't hesitate to email me because we've tried everything. So what we ended up doing um, was first we tried uh, LR white um, epoxy because it's really resinous and it flows through the, the material really well, but it, it didn't necessarily harden the right way. So it, in the end, um, we just kind of used a, a vacuum filter and um, just got as much epoxy as we possibly could into those syringe columns. Um, and just baked it for a really long time at low temperature in an oven. And uh, I'm glad to send you more of the details and also put you in contact with uh, Jess, who did most of the troubleshooting on that. But with, uh, with the smaller rocks and um, just crumbly crusts of carbonates, uh, basically what we do is we put them in a, a little muffin cup, an aluminum muffin cup, and um, Pour, pour epoxy into that and then keep it under under vacuum so it permeates into the pore spaces, but it takes a few days. Thank you. I love I love answers from scientists to those kind of questions because I know it's not so easy. It looks so easy whenever you present it, but it never is in reality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, we have uh, certainly time for a couple more questions. If anyone out there <clears throat> is willing to submit them, we have at least one more in the queue. Uh, but I'm going to ask a quick one that I, because I, I think many of my students from my class are here tonight, and I think one of the things that you have done very compellingly and very interestingly to me is demonstrate how useful mineralogy is as a tool in understanding these processes. And so can you speak to sort of what is at the cutting edge of mineralogy in, in terms of like practical applications in the field and, and how you're doing what you do with mineralogy as a tool? That's an awesome question. I could talk for hours about that, but I'll try to be concise for everyone's sake. I, I think we, we've come to a point where we can do a lot more field-based mineralogy. So elemental um, analyses, so for crystal chemistry and even field-based crystallography. So I've got an X-ray ray gun and a portable X-ray diffractometer that I take with me into the field. And so we can do mineralogy on the fly. So it, it doesn't um, 
remove the importance of techniques like fizz tests and the old looking rocks bit. Um, but we're starting to be able to take um, materials that are like almost like tricorders from Star Trek out into the field these days. And I, I think a, another useful thing is just bringing mineralogy out into the field gives us a better understanding of crystal chemical and crystallographic controls on element cycles. So one cool thing that we've started being able to do is to pinpoint exactly where um, metals and nutrients are in structural sites in landscapes. So we can start thinking about the mineralogy of environments and really how it controls reaction rates and flows of nutrients and contaminants and resources. Excellent, thank you. I, I love it. I, you know, I, as a geochemist, appreciate mineralogy, but I feel like I'm not a mineralogist and I still use those tools and I love them. So I'm very glad that you're doing it in the field, which is amazing. Um, so the next question is from Stephen uh, Leiblong. Uh, I very much enjoyed your presentation. And have you found an industrial partner who's willing to scale up this approach? I'm my coworkers on this and I are talking with an investor right now. So uh, stay tuned. Um, I'm knocking on wood. We might be able to give you an update in a few years. Excellent. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks if, if there's any concern that these methods are going to negatively affect groundwater. That's a really good question. And one of the reasons we, we've been working in mining environments is because these tend to be heavily regulated and the tailing storage facilities generally have really good impermeable liners, impermeable liners at their bases. But uh, the groundwater question is one that often comes up and I think it's one that we need to keep asking. And whenever we start to scale these processes up, we, we're gonna have to put in uh, groundwater monitoring wells and make sure that there are hydrogeologists working to ensure that um, demonstration sites are, are well-regulated and that we're making good decisions. I think a follow-up to that is, what are the current controls on the contaminants from these tailings piles into, into existing groundwater and, and can that be co-opted to also monitor for the, the types of carbonation and, and things like that that you're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So um, mines are required to have a really in-depth monitoring of, of groundwater and surface water chemistry. So there, there will be lots of uh, boreholes and monitoring wells um, in every single operating mine and uh, also in um, mines that have closed since so a combination of um, engineering um, liners and impermeable facilities, of course, these do sometimes leak. And then that um, in-depth uh, monitoring that's generally required by governments is in place. So that could be used um, for demonstration projects, definitely. OK, another question from Tom Gallagher, uh, which is, I think, a very good one for, for us Canadians. Are nickel deposits of the massive sulfide variety the perfect targets in Canada? And are our temperatures permissive to the rate of reactions? I think also alluding to the fact that you're talking also about crystal tail asbestos mines in some cases, which I know you and Ian have studied in the past. Yeah, that, that's a super question. Um, nickel sulfide deposits are, are the best because um, we were applying sulfuric acid because there wasn't any sulfur in the pile, but in nickel sulfides, you have that potential to generate sulfuric acid. So nickel sulfides are food for bacteria and they make the sulfuric acid for us. So that's something that we saw at the Mount Keith nickel mine, which is a nickel sulfide deposit, where we had, uh, one of the reasons we had accelerated weathering was because those nickel sulfides were dissolving, being eaten by microbes and leaching out magnesium when the microbes made sulfuric acid. So nickel sulfide deposits are fantastic for this because we need less acid. It's already in the rock. Okay, uh, the last question, which is going to be for me again, because I'm very, very keen tonight, uh, is this, so you and I were part of this mineralization and, and CDR, carbon dioxide removal uh, discussion uh, over the past couple of years. And I think to me, this one is a, is a clear no-brainer, right? <laughs> it's like, it's very 
it's top of top of the list. I mean, but are there other technologies, other things that you're thinking that like in Canada, like we're really ready to do and we should be doing right now? Um, there are so many things I want to say yes to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, what one thing we, we should be thinking about is uh, putting numbers on the potential of brines from oil and gas for carbonation. We have a lot of that stuff and it has ridiculous concentrations of calcium and magnesium in it, like 10, 20 grams of calcium per liter. So I think that's an interesting possibility. Um, also, uh, I, I think the ejection technologies could be really useful. We've, uh, we're world experts in direct air capture um, with uh, a lot of innovators in British Columbia working on that. So. And we have a lot of rocks that are, and basins that are good for storing CO2. So I think um, we, we don't wanna give up on um, CCS because we know it works, but we also have a lot of rocks I think that we could use uh, to form carbonate minerals um, below the surface of the earth without having to mine it. Excellent. And thanks all of you out there for your questions tonight. I'm gonna to turn it over to Steve Hubbard. Hi, everyone. Um, first, um, I really want to thank uh, Professor Wilson for joining us this evening to talk about uh, her really exciting research. Um, uh, we are, you know, we're all well aware of the challenge. We hear it often, the, uh, the challenge of reaching net zero uh, with a, what is, you know, comes up rather quick. And so it was a really inspiring um, to hear of ideas and potential solutions from some of the work you're doing. So it was a, just a really uh, wonderful um, uh, presentation, really grateful for it. I'd also like to thank everybody for being here um, to take taking this opportunity to learn from, from, uh, from, uh, from Sasha. Um, I, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, as we wrap up here tonight, I wanna highlight a couple of our upcoming events that I hope somebody will be able to join us for. Um, firstly, um, on uh, Friday, December 3rd, is our uh, third, uh, is our annual Tom Oliver uh, lecture. Um, Dr. David uh, Catling from the University of Washington uh, will discuss environments for the origin of life on early earth and elsewhere. Um, uh, our uh, Gallagher Colloquium series uh, will return in the new year on Thursday, January 27th. Um, Dr. Robert Hazen, a senior scientist at the Carnegie Institute for Science, his presentation uh, is titled How Life and Rocks Co-Evolve, the 4.5 billion year story of the Earth. So uh, lots of interesting uh, topics uh, on the horizon here. For the remaining three winner Gallagher lectures, um, online registration will open by the end of next week. Um, we'll also be sending out uh, email invitations by early December. And so if you haven't been receiving our emails about this series and would like to subscribe, please do reach out to us at um, SCI alumni, uh, SCI alumni at ucalgary.ca. Um, for clickable links to all the items just mentioned, uh, please see the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we've also shared the link uh, for our faculty's donate page. Uh, while we receive our core funding from the provincial government, much of the extra support uh, for our students and researchers or events like this one are made possible through individual and corporate gifts. Gifts of 10 to $20 out of quickly and make a real impact. So please consider donating. Um, uh, lastly, uh, when you see our event survey in your inbox tomorrow, uh, please do take a moment to fill it out. Uh, your feedback is really important and we wanna hear from you. Um, again, thank you for coming uh, and spending your evening with us and enjoy uh, the rest of it. Take care.